Before we read, um, I will pray for us and for Giles. Our Father in heaven, you told us in your Son that though heaven and earth will pass away, your words will never pass away. Thank you that you have shared your eternal word with us. Today, as Giles teaches us from your word, we pray that with your spirit we would pay careful attention to not just hear your word, but to do it. In the name of your Son and for your glory. Amen. We have two readings today. The first can be found on page 1022 in the Red Bibles. on page 1022, and we are reading from Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 20. Very early in the morning, the chief priests, with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin, made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things, so again Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to get Pilate to release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, uh, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Our second reading is on page 1233, that is 1233. And we are reading from Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 to 18. I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, 
and his eyes were like a blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Great, thank you, uh, Alex. Now, on the 16th of February this year, uh, Alexei Navalny, uh, the fiercest and most outspoken critic of the regime of Vladimir Putin, died at the age of 47 in a Russian corrective colony uh, in the, uh, up in the Arctic. And the cause of Navalny's death is apparently unknown and certainly undisclosed. But the official explanation that he died of natural causes seems to have persuaded nobody other than those who already wanted it to be true. Mr. Putin's regime makes no secret of being unfriendly to its critics. Um, and though the uh, inner workings of that regime are shrouded in mystery, it does seem fairly plain that someone high up in the government decided at some point, that man has got to go. Uh, who knows when that happened or, or how long it took for the plan to reach completion. We don't know, it probably took a long time. But Navalny is dead now, and such threat as he represented is no more. Now we reach Mark's Gospel chapter 15 this morning. Do please turn back to it with me, that's page 1022. And we pick up from where we left off a week ago. It's a continuous narrative, uh, the nighttime gathering of the Jewish council at which Jesus openly claims to be the Messiah is, uh, uh, gives way now to his appearance before Pilate. It's very early in the morning, it's before daybreak, and things move fast. And in fact, they have to move fast because the Roman governor dealt early with such things. Uh, by 10 o'clock at the latest, he'd have uh, dealt with the official business of the day and gone off to play golf or whatever Roman governors did for a relaxation by then. So the chief priests, who are the ones driving the process, move fast. They move very fast, and well before nine o'clock in the morning, Jesus is on his way to execution. And our question this morning, therefore, is how did this all happen, and at such speed? Because only a few hours before, Jesus was having his last meal with his friends, but they have all cleared off, and he's now entirely alone, and he's in the hands of his enemies, and in just a few hours he'll be dead. And we ask, how did this happen in this way? And we find the clue in verse 1. The chief priests made their plans. And it's not for the first time that they're planning and plotting. Way back in chapter 3, you may remember that Jesus deliberately provoked his critics by healing a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees immediately went out of the synagogue and began to plot his death. And that was some three years earlier. And ever since then, the threat of death has hung over Jesus of Nazareth. This man has got to go. He is too much of a threat. He must die. And they've not managed it earlier. They wanted to arrest him when he came to Jerusalem, but they were too afraid of the crowd who were on his side at the time. And only when Judas offers to lead them to him by night do they get their man. Uh, and now they have him. And this is a man who's committed undeniable blasphemy in their eyes, not only claiming to be the Messiah, but warning that they will see him, uh, the Son of Man, <clears throat> sitting at the right hand of the majesty and coming in the clouds of heaven. And they hear this and they say, finally, this man has got to go. But saying it is one thing, doing it is another. Uh, uh, and it's easier said than done. They have no authority to execute anyone, however much they may want to do it. It is the prerogative of the, of the Romans and therefore of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And that's why we learn here in verse 1, they make their plans. And if the plan is going to work, They've got to get the Roman governor on their side. And that is not going to be easy for several reasons. For one thing, Pilate couldn't care less 
about the Jews. He doesn't like them. Uh, worse, he despises them and everything about them. Uh, he holds the whole nation and its leaders in contempt. Uh, he already has accumulated a brutal record, and Luke in his gospel tells us about Galileans whose blood Pilate mixed with the animal sacrifices they were offering. Uh, so this is not the sort of guy to apply to if you want to be treated fairly, let alone kindly. Uh, his main aim is to prevent riots and to get through the Passover season without any major trouble and to keep the chief priests particularly in their place because they're such a nuisance. Uh, they're always playing little power games uh, against him. So he couldn't care less about the Jews, which means, of course, he couldn't care less about blasphemy. Now, for the priests, that was the, the issue. It was the final straw. For Pilate, it's a total irrelevance. Uh, so, so what if Jesus did say things like that about coming on the clouds of heaven? It's just a joke, isn't it? The man's a nutcase. So more fool you for taking him seriously and getting so worked up about it. And the third thing that's going to be difficult in getting Pilate on this side is that Jesus is totally innocent. He's innocent of anything, that is, that he could be charged with in a Roman court. Uh, the priests know it, and Pilate knows it. And Mark tells us in verse 9 that it's, he knows that it's only out of self-interest that the chief priests have handed him over. So for all these reasons, <clears throat> getting Pilate on board with that plot is going to be challenging. <clears throat> They've got to, come up, <clears throat> got to come up with something persuasive and fast, otherwise Pilate will have gone off to play his golf and they'll be stranded with their prisoner. It's not where they want to end up. And so they make their plan. Maybe somebody says, how about king of the Jews? That should do the trick. And this is a new title. <clears throat> no record of it in the previous 14 chapters, but now it's going to be useful. And so they bind Jesus and they lead him away and they hand him over to Pilate. And either verbally or in writing, we don't know which, they accuse him of this ambition to be the king of the Jews. And that, of course, is a charge that Pilate has to take seriously because of the implied threat to Roman rule. The threat of rebellion against Rome was never far away. There was no shortage of potential rebels, terrorists, if you like, desperate men who were willing to use Roman methods to overthrow Roman rule, to meet violence with violence. Now, this guy Barabbas rotting away in prison at the moment, was one such rebel awaiting execution. And maybe, Pilate has to think, maybe Jesus is another one. That's something he's going to have to take seriously. And so he asks, in verse 2, he asks the question, are you the king of the Jews? And he gets this rather evasive reply. You've said so. It's not a denial, and Pilate certainly doesn't take it that way. But for Jesus, plainly the title is misleading. It leaves a lot unsaid. It's open to misinterpretation. And of course, misinterpretation is exactly what the chief priests are hoping for. But if there is more to be said, Jesus doesn't say it. And Mark records no further words of Jesus till that great cry from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus makes no reply, and we read, Pilate is amazed. If you're familiar with Mark's Gospel, you'll know that he's not the first person of whom that is said. All through Mark's Gospel, people have been amazed at Jesus, at what he says and the things he does. The people in the synagogue are amazed at the effect of his teaching such that an impure spirit is driven out of a man shrieking in response to it. And then when he tells a paralyzed man on a stretcher that his sins are forgiven, and the man gets up and walks out of the room, the people there are amazed, saying, we've never seen anything like this. And when he calms the storm on Lake Galilee with a simple word, be still to the raging sea, and it is, the disciples in the boat are amazed, and they say, who is this that even wind and waves obey him? And when he enters the temple courts and drives out the money makers, the chief priests are too afraid to arrest him because the crowd are amazed at the teaching they hear. Over and over again, amazement is the word at what this extraordinary man 
does and says. And John in his gospel, in the gospel of John, it is said of him by people who went to arrest him, they couldn't do it. Why not? No man ever spoke like this man. Over and over again, amazement at what he says and does. But now here, for the first time, he causes amazement by saying nothing at all. And Pilate, amazed, can see that something very remarkable is going on before his eyes. He has never met a man like this. This is no normal prisoner. Uh, crucifixion was a, a particularly brutal way to kill a man, a long, lingering, agonizing death, probably as cruel a death as has, has, has ever been devised. And the Romans loved to use it because it showed everybody who was boss. The Romans ruled from the cross and were quite shameless about using it when they felt the need. And the threat of it hangs over this scene. Pilate knows it. The priests know it. Jesus knows it. And prisoners threatened with crucifixion would loudly protest their innocence. They would do anything, say anything to escape it, if they possibly could. But Jesus says nothing at all. Even when his accusers heap up other charges against him. And no wonder Pilate is amazed. He's never met anyone like this. And neither, of course, have you and I. Now, Pilate is a brute, <clears throat> but he's no fool. He knows the priest's game, and he doesn't want to play it. So when the supporters of Barabbas, Barabbas the, the uh, condemned prisoner, come up and ask him to release their man uh, as the uh, lucky beneficiary of the token gesture that's expected at Passover, Pilate has got a better idea. They ask for Barabbas, and Pilate says, well, hmm, how about this king of the Jews instead? which is a bad moment for the priests and their plan. But not for long, because if the crowd want Barabbas released, then Barabbas it will be. We need to remember that the atmosphere in Jerusalem at uh, Passover, Passover time would have been electric, uh, febrile. And for Pilate, annoying priests is fun. But annoying a mob, that's a different thing altogether, and he knows better than to do that. So for Pilate, never mind about truth and integrity and stupid little matters like that. No mind about, no matter, not to worry about doing the right thing. Being popular is what matters. Getting the popular vote. It's all that means, all that means anything to him. He's not going to care about anything else when his job might possibly be on the line. So the chief priests, they make their plan. And the plans are working like clockwork. And they now stir up the crowd who are already agitated. And so as a result, Barabbas goes free, and Jesus heads for the cross. Now, Mark's narrative is extremely restrained throughout. He avoids all sensationalism, all drama, other than the inherent drama of the story. There's no blood, no gore, no gruesome details. But behind the phrase in verse 15 that he had Jesus flogged, there lies a brutal Reality. It was standard practice to, to, to flog a man before crucifying. And the whips they used were made of leather with bits of bone and metal sewn in to cause maximum damage. In a flogging, bare flesh was ripped apart and the body's inside workings exposed. And men sometimes died from the flogging. Never made it to crucifixion. So when Simon of Cyrene, soon afterwards, is forced to carry Jesus' cross for him, it's not out of kindness to Jesus. It's just to make sure that he gets there. They make their plan. And all is going swimmingly. No turning back now. This man is going to die and die horribly. And soon it will be over and we can all go home and breathe again. When the news of um, Navalny's death came out, um, there was shock and anger in many places across the world. From the Kremlin, no comment at all. From his supporters and his family and his admirers inside and outside the country, there were statements of admiration and defiance and determination to fight on for the things he stood for and to keep his memory alive. 
But that is what he is already becoming, isn't it? And that was only two months ago, and he's already becoming a memory, a martyr to a just cause, a flawed martyr, no doubt, but a noble one in most people's eyes, overcome in the end by forces that proved too strong for him. And that might today be our view of Jesus of Nazareth. Certainly his enemies hoped that it would be, that he would soon be just a memory and before very long a distant one. And it's possible some people think of him like that today. What do you make of Jesus? Well, an inspirational teacher, a noble example, ultimately, I suppose, a victim. A wonderful life snuffed out by a brutal, tyrannical regime. They make their plan. And it does seem from an initial reading of the story that they've won. But Mark won't let us see it that way. He chooses his words very carefully. And to him, like to all the writers of the New Testament, Jesus is not the victim. Paradoxically, Jesus is the victor. And when we read this section of Mark's Gospel in the context of the whole, he would have us understand that running alongside and underneath the plotting of the priests, there is a deeper plan. And that is the second thing that we know it. I don't know if you're familiar with C.S. Lewis's marvellous uh, children's story. It's an adult story in some ways of the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. You may remember, if you do, that Aslan the Lion, who stands, he's really a Christ figure, walks with the white witch, his great enemy. And before very long, as a result of that negotiation, Aslan the Lion is dead because of deep magic from the dawn of time. It's a strange scene, deep magic before the dawn of time. But what the White Witch is unaware of is that there is a deeper magic from before the dawn of time. And it's a beautiful way of putting what's going on here. Because whereas the priest's plan has been brewing for three years, God's plan has been in place since before the beginning of time. And their plan is driven by envy and hatred and a lust for power, whereas his plan is born of love and of self-giving and of a limitless desire to serve. God's plan has been underway for centuries in the experience of Israel, and here it reaches its climax in the events that Mark has recorded so carefully. So we turn from their plan to his. It does look, of course, as if the priests are in charge. Before leading him away, they bind him. And that seems to say it all, doesn't it? We got our man. If you watch sort of um, something like that uh, series, Death in Paradise, and if you've ever seen that endless episode, it always ends the same way. Uh, the, uh, whoever was responsible for this unexplained death in this paradise island uh, is uh, found, and out come the handcuffs, and off they go. So here they bind Jesus and lead him away, but they don't need to do that. He's there of his own free will. And three times to date, Jesus has told his disciples not that he will suffer many things at the hands of the priests and the elders, but that he must. Not just that he will be killed and rise again, but that he has to. And now when they come to arrest him, he sticks to this line because the Old Testament scriptures, full of God's plan, must be fulfilled. So they've no need to bind him. He's not going to run away. The disciples have, his friends have, of course, all of them have cleared off scarpet. But not Jesus. He keeps going. And we might be tempted to say, well, he was God's son, wasn't he? Well, it was easier for him. Had special powers and so on. But it's not what the Bible says. What Mark says is that Jesus prayed earnestly in the garden. And the disciples didn't. They slept. And so when the soldiers came, Jesus stood firm and they fled. He's here out of obedience to God his Father. He made that plain in the garden as he prayed. He's not going to run away. He's ready to give his life as a ransom, the 
essential, unavoidable ransom for many. And the many, in that phrase, must include you and me if we are to find peace with God and enjoy his fatherhood. And John Calvin, that old commentator, puts it beautifully. This is what he said about this passage. The Son of God chooses to stand bound before an earthly judge there to receive the sentence of death in order that you and I, delivered through him from the condemnation we deserve, may approach God's heavenly throne with confidence. He remained silent before Pilate so that he may now be our advocate and speak in heaven on our behalf. And among the Old Testament scriptures that predict these things, it is the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah, which lies most clearly, I think, behind Mark's narrative, as well, surely, as being in the mind of Jesus. And we see that in the silence and the scourging and the scorn. Let's think about each of those. The silence, for one thing. We saw this in last week's passage. Isaiah wrote prophetically many centuries before in these words that he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. He, the innocent one, makes no attempt at self-defense. This is the way he must go. He's known it all along, and though in Gethsemane it is true that his vision was briefly blurred, his will remained steadfast all the way. So there's the silence, as I said. And then there's the scourging. And the scene in verses 16 to 20 with the soldiers mocking Jesus is a horrible one. The trial, if we can call it that, took place in the open. But then there's this episode inside, out of sight, the episode of brutal, sadistic torture at the hands of the soldiers. And soldiers in hostile situation, as we will know from modern conflicts, can easily get brutalized. And these ones certainly have. They wouldn't have chosen to be there. They didn't want to be there. They'd probably been hauled in from duties out in the countryside. They would be very on edge with a suppressed populace surging around them. And when Pilate says, here's the king of the Jews, help yourself, they're not going to miss their chance. Come on, lads. This is our moment. Let's have some fun. And they do. A purple robe for this king and a crown of thorns. And the crown of thorns may or may not have been actually part of the torture. It may have just have been part of the mockery with jagged thorns pointing upwards and outwards like the rays of the sun because kings at that time sometimes wore crowns like that. Either, either way, it's mockery. And then there's the spitting and the repeated beating and the bended knee and the bowing down. A scene which Calvin says calls more for private meditation than for ornamentation with words. And this scourging is no necessary part of the narrative. Mark didn't have to tell us about it. You could go straight from the flogging in verse 15 to the cross. But this is all as Isaiah had said it would be in his great prophecy. And speaking of the Lord's servant, he, he wrote again, he offered his back to those who beat him and did not hide his face from spitting and shame. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. It's all there, the silence, the scourging, and the scorn. Hail, king of the Jews. And they fall down on their knees before this man with his kingly robe and his crown. Six times in 32 verses, Mark repeats the phrase, the king of the Jews. Because that is what he is, and not of Jews only. And if these rough and ready soldiers could see Jesus as he now is, they would see him the way John sees him in that great opening chapter of the book of Revelation. No longer mocked with a bogus robe and a crown of thorns, but magnificently robed in white with a golden sash around his waist, his face no longer scarred and bleeding, 
It's shining like the sun in all its brilliance. And his lips no longer sealed, because his voice is now like the roar of a great waterfall. And when John sees Jesus in his glory, he falls at his feet like a dead man. And we read elsewhere that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every eye will see him, says John, those who pierced him. And all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. Why will we mourn at this scene? These things are not written down to make us feel sorry for Jesus. They're written down to make us sorry about ourselves and our sin and the state of our world, about the corruption and the insanity of our human nature, which this narrative forces us to recognize. Because when the Son of God, full of truth and beauty and goodness, comes into our world, in search of wayward humanity, we say we don't want to know. We object to his inquiries and his invitation and his gracious interference, and we turn away, like the crowd here in verse 13. Pilate has agreed to release Barabbas at their request, wants to be popular, and then he says, well, what about this one? What shall I do with him? And they say, crucify him. And Pilate, frowning probably, says, but, but why? What's he ever done wrong? But he gets no answer. They just turn up the volume. Crucify him! And that question, why, on Pilate's lips, is left hanging in the air today as much as then. Why the widespread indifference to Jesus, the indifference that actually conceals a deeper hostility to him and his gracious call. Why? It's, in, it's insane. There really is no answer. Pilate, you notice, had a previous question, of course. And his previous question is one that each of us must address sooner or later. What then shall I do with this king of the Jews? What shall I do with Jesus. The crowd tragically gives the wrong answer when the right one, the only one that makes sense, is to bow the knee and to kneel at his feet in thankfulness and in humble surrender. 